Um, I mentioned last week that Leviticus 18 is this week, and it deals with sexual purity. And with that in mind, I had asked Donna if she would prepare something for the younger kids. Last week, we had a whole slew of younger kids. Um, and I was concerned that the parents, some of those parents may have been not necessarily wanting their kids to be in on that. Uh, my kids are going to stay in here, so Donna's off the hook for Children's Church. But um, I was going to say that the reality of it is the kids are being taught sexuality all the way down to kindergarten <clears throat> if they're in the public school system. If it's not coming from the class, from the teachers, it's coming from their peers. But they're being taught this in the school. So for us to, in the church, say, well, we're not going to talk about it in front of our kids is mm, maybe not the best approach. It doesn't apply to us this morning because these kids um, weren't able to be here this morning. But um, nonetheless, um, this is a topic that the church has... The, the title, prudish sexuality, the, the church has kind of avoided this topic. And Leviticus 18, it's really difficult. If you read Leviticus 18 this week, you know it covers some stuff. You're like, oh, man, are we really going to talk about this in church? And yes, we are. Because the church has, for a long time, kind of said, well, these aren't things we talk about in church. And society, therefore, has taken that mantle, and they have talked about it, and they're, they're teaching it. And what's worst about that is not so much what's going on in society as the fact that that has come into the church. And the church is not sure about these things as well. In fact, uh, if you, you, you may know that I've been under attack because of some things I posted about this message. This is from God's Word, guys. I can't just say... Well, it doesn't really, it's Leviticus, so it doesn't really count. It does. And what we're going to see in Leviticus 18 is that it, it applies not only to the church, but it goes outside the church as well. And that's where I get in trouble. Because it's okay as long as I'm only peeking here. But if I step outside of these four walls and start talking about this thing, now all of a sudden I've crossed a line and I'm in trouble. Talk to our neighbors to the north in Canada. They can't even say it inside the church anymore. For a long time, they haven't been able to say it outside the church. Now they can't even say it inside the church. But we in America, we enjoy our freedoms. We take them for granted. And so this morning, as I preach from Leviticus 18, we need to put aside all these ideas that, well, it's Leviticus and it doesn't, it doesn't apply to us anymore. Hopefully by now, we're at chapter 18, we've been in Leviticus a long time. Hopefully by now, you've already got that out of your mind anyway. So we are in Leviticus 18, and God turns his attention at chapter 18. So chapter 17, we're talking about all this stuff about blood and, and regulations relating to blood because it, it showed the atonement. Blood was significant, is significant in the atonement process, which was chapter 16, the atonement. And so all of a sudden, the attention shifts now to laws about moral purity. There it is, moral purity. That's Leviticus 18 through 20. So the next three chapters, this chapter and the next two, are going to be discussing moral purity. And so for outlining this, the the... There's only going to be one point today, and it's letter A, sexual purity, because that's all of Leviticus 18. Leviticus 19 will cover something different and 20-something else. So this today is sexual purity. Now, moral purity is important, and that's he, he changes now from the atonement to moral purity, because even though uh, sin has been atoned, it doesn't mean that we're free to continue to live in it or return to it. And so it opens with this sexual purity first. And Leviticus 18.1, we, we hear the, a familiar phrase, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them. Now this is actually written in the form of a covenant treaty. 
And this is the recognizable form of the preamble within that covenant. Now he's speaking to Moses here, again, to deliver a message to Israel that starts with the phrase used to introduce covenants. I am the Lord your God. Literally, Jehovah, so when you see those L-O-R-D in all caps, it's the Hebrew, Jehovah, which means the existing one. The Lord your God, God is Elohim, which is the true God. I mean, it's just God. So the existing one, your God. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do because I exist on my own. And I am your God. I am in charge of you. I am your God. Don't confuse me with the gods of of these other nations and what you've lived and what you're going to live because I am your God. I am the existing one. Indeed, those other gods don't exist at all. Only Jehovah, he says exists. Now this phrase, he repeats it one more time in the opening lines, and then it's, it's an impetus for obeying him. And then he ends this, what we would call perhaps a sub-covenant within this larger covenant, with that same signature. And then we find this phrase, I am the Lord your God, 42 times in the remainder of Leviticus, and there's not a whole lot left of it. So God reiterates this um, to this um, over and over, I am the Lord your God, I am the Lord your God. Don't forget this. This is why I'm giving you all of these things, because I am the Lord your God. They couldn't miss this fact, nor the fact that he was making covenant with them. And they were to respond to this fact by not doing something, namely not doing what the world was doing. God told them in verse 3, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. Now, this is the key to reading this passage. But we need to read it from the perspective of these Hebrews who had just been liberated from bondage in Egypt. Egypt was this powerful world empire. Very powerful. Very religious also, by the way. And so the Hebrews would have understood this in ways that we can't fully grasp without doing a level of research into what the Egyptians did. That said, it's premature to conclude uh, what they did in that land of Egypt or Canaan that God wanted them to avoid because he hasn't said that yet. We can only conclude at this point that God expects his people to live differently than the world that follows their own imaginations of spiritual reality. And that's an important distinction God's people living at any time in any place must make. Whether people believe there is no God at all, except perhaps science and logic, or if they believe that spiritual reality is really simply what each person makes it out to be. People today, as throughout time, recognize spiritual reality in some form or fashion. And that spiritual view shapes their approach to life, to morality, to behavior, and to religion. Thus, God's warning to not walk in their statutes or as I paraphrase it in in the outline, don't do like the world, transcends time and culture. Instead, God says in verse 4, Leviticus 18, you shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. There it is again. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. In short, God says, I am the Lord your God, obey me and live. Except that he didn't say it in that order. First, he demanded that they follow his rules, keep his statutes, and walk in them. Now, I had you write walk in the blank this time. Because it's an obvious contrast to walking in the statutes of the world around them, the world that rejects God. Don't walk in those. God says, I have some other things 
that I want you to do. You walk in these. It's about more than just following rules, though, although it is explicitly that. It's about practicing the principles contained therein. So fast forward some 1,500 years when Jesus arrives on the scene. All this had been given. The religious elite who claimed to follow God's rules and keep his statutes may have succeeded in keeping those rules, but they had failed to walk in them. They were masters at coming up with ways to appear to follow God's way while not actually practicing any of it. They neither walked in them nor lived by them. Their lives were not transformed. They were religious, but they had not been transformed. That's a key word, and, and that's a word you've heard me say many. In fact, I had a whole sermon, I think it was two weeks ago, about transformation. When Jesus comes on the scene, these Pharisees, these scribes, these people who had, who had enforced the law, they were, their lives had not been transformed. They were just religious, and there's a marked difference. And so Matthew 23 records Jesus addressing the scribes and the Pharisees of his day. If you want to turn there, you can. I'll have it on the screen, but I'm going to read quite a bit out of Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples. So he's speaking now to the crowds, to the disciples. He says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So there they sat as the authorities on, on the law, and they were teaching the law. And so Jesus says, practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. And skip down to verse 15. He now speaks directly to the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child, a child of hell as you yourselves. Verse 16, Woe to you, blind guides, who say if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that has made the gold sacred, or, or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he's bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? And then he speaks another word, woe to them in verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. And then he gives another woe. Woe to you, <clears throat> scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And he ends it in verse, thir- we'll skip down to verse 33. You serpents, you brood of vipers. How are, you to, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? You see, these men had completely missed the point of, this, of these laws of Moses that we're reading here. The reason they had missed the point was because they had missed the God who gave them those things. They had missed the fact that I am the Lord your God. They had missed that, even though it's repeated over and over and over. They become so focused on the laws and the great prestige and power they had, they had amassed that they had completely forgotten about God. 
So they had forgotten that all-important phrase that I am the Lord, your God. Because the existing one, Jehovah, Lord, was their God. They were to keep his statutes and his rules and live by them. This is where the Pharisees and scribes Jesus had condemned had failed. They didn't live by them at all. They demanded others do so, but they only pretended to do so themselves. And this is the thing about which God warned the Hebrews when he established his covenant with them as described in Leviticus 17. God ends this introductory section and begins a list of rules and statutes with the statement, again, I am the Lord, this time omitting the qualifier that he was their God. By, by this, he declares simply his authority as Jehovah, the existing one, to make the statutes that follow. Remember that God had already said they were not to do as they had done in the land of Egypt or as, they were gonna, as the people do in the land of Canaan. And that would have led to the obvious question even for them, what are we not to do that they did? And God gives the answer by giving his own statutes that opposed things sanctioned and practiced by the pagans among whom they lived. And they would have immediately recognized these commonplace behaviors of society. It starts with verse 6, Leviticus 18. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncovered nakedness. I am the Lord. Now, this introduces the first section of the covenant regarding sexual purity. Do not uncover the nakedness of close relatives. And it's a lengthy section that follows verse 6. and describes many relationships um, under the heading of close relatives. It does not, however, clearly, de clearly describe what is meant by uncover nakedness. And we think, well, that, that's just some term that they understood. Well, it, it's, it seems to be some sort of a, a Hebrew word that was this kind of a polite way of describing sexual relations. It was kind of a, it, it was without saying it, saying it type thing. And likely the Hebrews would have understood it immediately. Um, it, it, the Hebrews, it can also refer to cohabitation. And some scholars hold that it refers then to marriage and not just strictly sexual relationships. Either way, it's an uncomfortable subject that seems perhaps to us an odd thing to bring up. Some of you may have heard, if you, I'm not actually going to read all those different relationships, verses 6 through 18. You can read them later if you want to. But if you read them, uh, uh, as I was reading them, a secular song came to mind. You may have heard the, the song, Willie Nelson actually sang this song. So it's got to be biblical, right? Um, it chronicles the tale of a young man as a title of, declares, title of the song declares who became his own grandpa. Have you ever heard that song? It's a pretty, it's a pretty silly song. It goes... Now, many, many years ago, when I was 23, I was married to a widow who was pretty as could be. This widow had a grown-up daughter, had hair of red. My father, my father fell in love with her, and soon the two were wed. This made my dad my son-in-law and changed my very life. My daughter was my mother because she was my father's wife. Are you lost yet? And the tale kind of spirals downward from there until finally he arrives at the conclusion, for now I have become the strangest case you ever saw. As husband of my grandmother, I am my own grandpa. And we laugh and we go, because it's funny. And it's, it's not meant to be serious. It's just kind of a, a goofy thing. And it seems to be something that was a story, I guess, out of a newspaper from the 1800s that somebody changed into a song. Willie Nelson didn't actually write it, but that's, that's neither here nor there. But this, this picture may have come to mind, may come to mind as you read the relationships in Leviticus 18. You're like, what in the world? You really have to tell someone not to marry their brother or their sister? That doesn't make, of course we don't do that. 
You really have to tell someone not to marry their daughter or their grandmother? Do we really need to really? We scratch our heads, and again, the, the the Willie Nelson, the song Willie Nelson sang, really does. You're like, oh, here are some backwoods people here, and we wonder why. But one thing that that we need to bear in mind, the two things actually. First of all, our own understanding of these things and our natural abhorrence of them stems from the influence of this very passage of Scripture on our own culture and laws for many centuries. The taboo nature of these kinds of relationships in the minds of most people goes without saying largely because of precisely what we read in Leviticus 18, 6 through 18. As laughable as it may seem, let me insert here an important comment regarding common sense laws and things like this that go without saying. We stand on shaky ground and shifting sand when we stand on what appear to be common sense or self-evident laws. We shake our heads in disbelief that someone would ever even consider something like this. Why would you even need to have this as a law? But don't think for a minute that that couldn't change practically overnight. Because we've seen it in our own culture in many other areas in just the past few years. We scoff at the backwardness of relatives marrying one another. But history is clear that even societies as scientifically, technologically, and culturally advanced as Egypt commonly practiced and even publicly sanctioned this kind of thing. In fact, even sisters were commonly taken in marriage in Egyptian culture. That's why God addresses it here, because they had seen it going on in Egypt. Brothers and sisters marrying. It was commonplace in Egypt. We're like, what? I mean... Don't think of Egypt as some sort of backwoods hit country. They were a world superpower. They were the world superpower for a time. But somehow they had they had gotten this idea, whether it was, oh well, they just love each other. Who are we to forbid them from, from marrying? I don't know. Or maybe it was, well, it really keeps all the wealth in the family better that way. Who knows? seems to have some connection to the religion. Whatever the case, it was going on in Egypt, and it was also going on in Canaan. So the Hebrews had left this in Egypt, and they were about to go into a new land where it was also being practiced. The Hebrews may have been tempted to keep this practice and themselves sanction it. Because again, I mean, there's, it makes, well, you know, if these two love each other, I mean, really love each other, well, why shouldn't they just, we, why shouldn't we just uh, uh, legally recognize it and, and let them do what they want to do legally and not feel so guilty about it? Why should society, much less religious institutions, deny them the right to express their love even sexually within the recognized bonds of marriage like others can? And that is precisely why God listed all the possible ways people might try to get around the definition of close relative. This argument we have heard in recent years may or may not be a new thing, probably is not, but the concept of free love, as it's called mistakenly, is anything but new. Now, there certainly could have been other reasons in the ancient Hebrew culture to marry, but we shouldn't overlook the unchanging nature of the human libido and the influence of the flesh in driving one to act as even Absalom did toward his own sister. Remember that story? I'm not even going to go into it. You can look it up, 2 Samuel 13. Absalom 
David's own son burned with lust for his sister. Now his sister was like, mm, no, mm. but it wasn't good enough for Absalom. So it wasn't, it, it, we have scriptural evidence of it going on even in the Jews, the Israelites. And so God lays it out. And though this topic dominates the passage comprising the vast majority of the text, God had other concerns about his people recognizing the risks of the reproductive and sexual practices of the people among whom they lived. In the second section of this sub-covenant, then, he addresses issues relating to preserving the honor of the marriage bed. Now it's about to get really uncomfortable. Verse 19. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her. Now verse 20 is pretty straightforward. We shouldn't have any problem with this. It's that it's the reiteration of the commandment, the seventh commandment, not to commit adultery. But what are we to do with verse 19, not uncovering the nakedness of a woman in her menstruation? Now, I found it interesting because it's like, well, I mean, compared to the other things, it seems like, well, well what, why is this here? And you would think that someone like the Matthew Henry or John MacArthur or one of those great men of God who are scholars and it's much smarter than me and who've written volumes upon these things would have mentioned something about that. But in the 10 or so different scholars that I looked up, uh, there was hardly anything said about this. Leaving me going, well, what gift? That seems like a pretty, seems like a pretty, why is this here? Of all places. Next to homosexuality and bestiality, why is this here? Now, I think it's important. We do find this mentioned in the laws for ritual purity. We saw it in chapter 15. If any man lies with her and her menstrual impurity comes upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Now, on in that instruction, it's not an intentional act. But here in chapter 18, it's addressed as something done presumptuously. And it's going to be addressed again later in this section, discussing moral purity in chapter 20, with the consequence for ignoring it as being cut off from among their people. And then in Ezekiel chapter 22, it's listed um, with the consequence, right along with the consequence for ignoring the uh, warning of uncovering the father's nakedness as as something, as an indictment against God's people for the judgment that he was pouring out on them. And so we see that God is pretty concerned about this, but we still haven't figured out why it's listed here right next to not lying sexually with another person's spouse. Well, now that infraction is a, is a clear violation, as we said, of the seventh commandment. That's why I put both of these things under the broader heading of preserving the honor of the marriage bed. It's something that carries over into the New Test New Covenant. We find in Hebrews chapter 13, we find it in a list of various things provided in the closing lines of the book as final words on how to live out the Christian faith. Hebrews 13, 14 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. There are, we know, certain health reasons involved with this. But God is concerned that even the marriage bed be treated with honor. Now, I, I don't want to dwell too much on what is an uncomfortable subject. But again, this verse vexes me. And we'll have to address it again in chapter 20, so we might as well deal with it now. Because in chapter 20, it includes a warning, again, of being cut off from among their people. If you ignore this law. The language is reminiscent of what would happen to the one who disregarded the blood of animals in the section right before this, in chapter 17, where that person who ignored that was also to be cut off 
for among his people. Blood's place in the atonement for sin meant it was to be treated with great care. To then incorporate blood into the marriage bed would have been the ultimate disregard for the significance of blood. And so here we have it in the Old Covenant right alongside adultery as a critical and first aspect of keeping the marriage bed pure. All right, I don't know if we've answered that question, but I think we've dealt with enough. We're going to move on. (laughs) We're going to get off that one now. We're going to move on to the next, you shall not. Verse 21, you shall not give any of your children to offer them up to Molech and so profane the name of the Lord, of your God. I am the Lord. Now, I listed this as starting a new section of laws against common unnatural idolatrous practices in verses 21 to 23 of both the Egyptians and the Canaanites of their day. The previous things were common practices in the world of their day, and they were tied to religious beliefs. But the following things were part of religious rites and cultic practices. First of all, not to give your children to Molech. Now, we should... One of the things that should immediately come to mind is, okay, so we have identified, I've identified this, I've just told you, chapter 18 deals with sexual purity. And so when you come to this offering children to Moloch, we should kind of go, well, what's this doing here? In In a chapter dealing with, in a covenant dealing with sexual purity, why this now? Perhaps the King James rendering of and don't let any seed pass through the fire, could have some sexual connotation. But ESV's not give any of your children to offer them to Molech conveys the original meaning more clearly to modern readers. Now, we do know quite a bit about Molech from other biblical references as well as extra-biblical sources. Molech was the god of the Ammonites. His metal image was heated red-hot and babies were placed in his arms and burned to death as a means of procuring procuring good fortune for the rest of a couple's children. Now, there may have been some unmentioned sexual perversion connected with this pagan ritual, such as dedicating children as cult prostitutes, which would explain the placement of this prohibition in this covenant on sexual purity. But the Hebrews needed no further explanation, for they knew intuitively what this meant. For the new covenant believer, children being the God-given result of sexual relations, now we understand perhaps why you've got this right here. This is what happens when people, when two people come together and have sex, children are the natural result of that. And so God is dealing with this aspect of it. And so, in the New Covenant, perhaps that means protecting our children from the cultic influences of the world. And though we don't have anything as obvious as heating up uh, uh, a metal idol and burning babies on it, our culture has its fair share of things that either outright kill babies or, in more subtle ways, destroy the lives of children. This is why Christians since the first century, have fought for and rescued children from certain death in many ways. And it's why we continue to fight for them even today. And when we come to the final two aspects of this section, dealing with cultic practices, keep in mind that people, Christians and non-Christians alike, used to turn their noses at even the mention of these kinds of practices, even just 30 years ago. So think back, we, we, we open this, the section opens with this idea of sexual relations amongst close relatives. We're like, ugh, ugh. We don't really need to even hear that. We understand that. Keep in mind that even just 30 years ago, people used to say the same thing about these next two things. Leviticus 18.22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is a perversion. 
never, I would never marry my sister. Ugh. But now, when it comes to these things, well, maybe that's okay. That's what we're hearing. Not just in society, guys, but in the church, we're hearing this. Now, as I said earlier, the influence of this passage of Scripture on the thinking of people for centuries produced a natural distaste for this kind of behavior, like that of incest. Although even cultures never influenced by Christianity or the Bible often had similar distaste. Still, we cannot assume that common sense, nature, or even science are sufficient evidences of the destructive and debasing nature of these aspects. They were as commonplace among otherwise, as otherwise sophisticated and scientifically advanced societies as ancestral marriages. They were even going on in Egypt, Rome, Canaan. When those cultures finally arrived at the height of their, of their kingdoms and their, their wealth and their influence, the deviant sexual behavior rapidly increased. And it led to the demise of those cultures. We can shake our heads in disbelief of our own so-called forward-thinking world embracing these behaviors, but we dare not turn a blind eye to them being embraced in the church as they are at an alarming pace. When God told the people living in covenant with him, do not practice homosexuality and do not practice bestiality, it was because as the designer of sexuality, he saw homosexuality as an abomination and bestiality as a perversion. And his view hasn't changed. That's why when he gave the curse section of this purity covenant, in verses 24 to 30, that he reiterated what he said in the preamble. Leviticus 18, 24. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of those abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations, so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you, and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Now, in this last section, notice the repetition of the sin of the people living the land that God had given the Israelites. Now, bear in mind that those people were not bound by any covenant with God. That's significant. These were not God's people. But still God held them accountable for that sin. And not only that, God said that the land itself had become unclean, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. These sexual sins had polluted the very land the people occupied and had, had literally made the land sick. The land was sick. And this had nothing to do with the fact that this was old covenant law. The Canaanites were never bound to that law. They didn't receive it from Moses. Their sexual perversions and deviations were against God's nature and clear and obvious design. It left them, as Romans 1.20 says, without excuse. Because it's obvious. You don't even need God to tell you. It's obvious. It is self-evidence. 
We can ignore the sexual deviancy so prevalent in our culture today if we want. We can ignore the 31 flavors of sexuality represented by the LGBTQ, and now they've added plus just in case they missed anything. We can ignore the sacrifice of human babies necessary because of the lack of respect for sexual activity. Did you hear that? Picture Molech with his burning arms. How could anyone be so heartless to put a baby in those burning arms? The the natural result of two people coming together is a baby being born. Let's burn that baby up on Molech. How could they be so heartless? Well, we do it in, in America. It's much more clean than that, or so we're told. It's done before the baby's even born. Oh, the baby doesn't feel it. The baby doesn't remember it. Hmm. We have, we're an advanced society. We can see the baby in the womb. We can even tell if it's a boy or a girl. And we can't ask it if it thinks it's a boy or a girl because it hasn't quite figured that part out yet on its own because that's, I guess, what babies do now. But we can look in there and we can say, oh, that's a boy. Oh, that's a girl. But it's not really a baby. It's just fetal material until it comes out of the womb. Although even now today, after it comes out of the womb. And by the way, Congress right now is about to enshrine that as law in our land. That should bother us. Christian or not, that should bother us. And you that are watching online that want to gripe at me because all the church has no business, baloney. If the church isn't going to stand for this, who is? If the church is not going to stand for the lives of these unborn babies, who is? The president? (laughs) Congress? They're making laws right now to kill these little babies. Don't give me that. We must stand for the lives of these babies. How could anybody burn a baby on Molech? Oh, they're so backwards. Oh, those ancient Canaanites. Oh, the Ammonites. Oh, my goodness. We do it in a doctor's office. That land was sick because of what the Canaanites were doing. And the Canaanites had no covenant with God. And God said, I'm holding them accountable. I don't care if they don't have a covenant with me. They're accountable for this. Don't think for a minute that America will not be held accountable for all the junk that we have done over the last 50 years in this regard. We absolutely will. We absolutely are. This is clearly an aspect of God's design for humanity. And it's not dependent on a covenant that he made with the Hebrews thousands of years ago. It's also not strictly related to the covenant he offered to all of humanity through the blood of his Son. Now, absolutely, those living under the covenant in Christ's blood are bound by these restrictions. We're not to live in a manner the world as the world lives in its warped view of human sexuality. These behaviors should not be practiced or tolerated in the church, much less endorsed or sanctioned by her whether it's incestual relationships, dishonoring the marriage bed, or submitting our children to the sexual mores of the world, or engaging in homosexuality or bestiality, it naturally leads to destruction. We see it in the world. We should not see it in the church. It's high time we do more than fuss and fume over the absurdity of the world's view of human sexuality and teach God's design for it. And this is why I wanted my children in here this morning. 
And they've heard this before, so it's not news to them. But we must teach our children these things because the world is. And they don't even have to get it in the school, though they will. It's all around. It's in commercials. You don't have to, they don't even have to watch, quote, bad programs. The commercials have it. We must teach our children these things. The land itself, what Leviticus 18 tells us, is sick because of this. Economic collapse and worse will result. Look back in history It always has, because it's the hand of God bringing judgment on the land. And we sit on our hands and go, well, we we don't want to offend anybody. It's not our place. We're only only supposed to teach in the church. We don't want to force our views. So we let the world go to hell in a handbasket because we're not going to force anything on them should bother us. What can we do? We need to be praying. And can I just say that when we pray, when we pray for real, what happens is God begins to change our hearts. I could make a call to action and say, well, you need to go sign a petition or go march or whatever. But I believe that when God's people truly pray, and humble themselves before God, the natural result will be we can't just sit around. Whether that's when I'm praying for someone who's lost, who I want to see come to Jesus, or whether it's one of these issues here in Leviticus 18, whatever it is, as I'm praying, God begins to move in my heart and say, you need to do this. Perhaps that's why church has been absent in much of this for so long because the church doesn't pray and I'm speaking big church we're too busy to pray yeah you know what does it matter God's gonna do what he's gonna do anyway so why should I bother praying the church has not prayed and we see the results of it in society but more to the point in the church. So as I close us this morning in prayer, it is a call to you to pray now, but also to continue to pray. We have a list of things in the bulletin to pray for. A lot of those are health issues. We have a lot of people who are sick this morning, which is why a lot of them are watching online right now instead of here. We have, there's other things in that bulletin The Supreme Court right now is writing their opinions that could shape the laws on abortion, which, by the way, is why Congress has said, well, we're going to circumvent the Supreme Court and just go ahead right now and make a law that legalizes killing babies. Those are things about which we need to pray. Because God says the heart of the king is as the rivers of water. It's in his hands. He controls it. He guides it where he wants to. And God can do that right now in the hearts of the Supreme Court justices, in the hearts of our congressmen and women, in the hearts of our president, in the hearts of our national, state, and local leaders. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, the charge you have given me to declare your word. And Lord, uh, these scriptures are uh, surprisingly controversial, apparently. And Lord, I just pray that um, you would move in our hearts as we read not just these scriptures, but other scriptures. Lord, that we would approach these scriptures humbly, asking your direction. And Lord, this morning as I have preached this word,
from your word. My goal was not to, uh, not to um, ad advance some agenda. My goal was to preach your word. To dig into the heart of Leviticus 18 and hear what the Holy Spirit was saying thousands of years ago to the Hebrews and saying now to us living under the new covenant in Christ's blood. And Lord, I pray that you would move in the hearts of each person who heard this message. Lord, I pray for those who oppose this message. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to see what you're saying through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to close with this passage of scripture. I've read it many times, but I want you to hear this this morning as a prayer for God to work in your heart through this message. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. I've read it the last few weeks. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, set you apart completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.